In the summer of 1999 in Adelaide, I had just made the leap from 4Track to iMac for recording demos, but I hadn't consciously set out to work with anyone else until I saw a local band called Mobile for the first time. They were clearly inspired by various 1980s guitar and electronics groups like New Order, who I still love, and I was especially drawn to Matt Harris's guitar playing. After the show, I introduced myself to Matt, gushing about his harmonically inventive playing, and I said I'd like to form a band with him. I handed him a cassette of three demos recorded under the name The American Public. It was a name which reflected my fascination with US culture and influence. This was homage, but it was also cynical. Matt was into it, and during our first jam together, he and I co-wrote Jail Song, which would appear on our first EP, Peachment, a name Matt came up with, which was another riff on the US. The cover image was very much inspired by this photo by Rolf Nafziger called Hostage, which he took in 1989. I still think this is a very striking image, which relates well with the band name. I thought it would be interesting to reinterpret the scene and reverse the roles and shoot it in colour. It also gave me an excuse to shoot photos of my friend Georgia, who was very much my muse at the time. As we were writing Peachment, Matt was corresponding with Tim Mortimer, who at the time was planning to return to South Australia from the UK. Tim was the songwriter and vocalist in early 90s group The Mandelbrot Set, the career of which he described as having ended in a sea of drugs and apathy. Tim liked the demos Matt sent him and joined the band. Given that Peachment was written by the time he arrived, Tim's role was that of executive arranger, but he had no shortage of material to offer for the next record. He was a strong proponent of the American public as an umbrella for the output of its constituent parts, as well as inviting collaboration from other artists. Matt was also friends with Jason Bootle, founder of Pop Gun Records, who liked what he heard and threw his support behind the EP. Up until that point, Matt and I had been playing shows as a duo, usually with backing beats for half the set. I think the first time Tim played with us was during a power pop tribute night at the Crown and Scepter. And whilst we set out to have no defined musical roles, I saw myself as the driver of the band and I became more creatively invested in our material and determined to achieve quote unquote success. At that inaugural Matt, Ben, Tim gig, we put out the call for a drummer. Mel Horseman volunteered. She'd been playing for some time with a band called The Lift Dwellers. And for a winking moment in time, the American public were a quartet. Tim started sharing vocal duties and having three songwriters in the band was great because I think we all also enjoyed just stepping back and playing. We did a handful of shows together with this lineup and the gig I remember most was again at FAD in which Tim and I argued with each other on mic, of course. Tim and Matt introduced me to the world of MIDI and desktop audio workstation arrangement. Tim introduced sample and beat based collage to our repertoire, although we never quite got to fully integrate that into the live set. We were a hit machine in our own minds. Between the three of us, we were writing more demos than we knew what to do with. Yo 
so an independent label called Wash Records took an interest in us. This was run by Helen Tillman, who also managed Sydney bands Faker and Dappled Cities. Tim wasn't so sure about the Wash Records situation, and he and I were arguing a lot about the music. Neither of us were navigating these disagreements very well, and I wound up firing Tim from the group, perhaps in an egocentric preemptive strike when I sensed the writing on the wall. I actually called him a Nazi pothead during one email tirade or another, oblivious to the joke, of course. Ironically, my determination to lead the band unhindered and to steer the SS public towards top 40 glory was in part thwarted by the creative limitations of being in a standard three-piece rock lineup. A middle-of-the-road EP followed. Matt might not have been as prolific a songwriter as me, but the slightly oddball and distinctive melodic sensibility that he brought to his and to my material wasn't used to its full extent on that record. It all sort of sounds a bit corporate. We put in a few mini tours of Sydney and Melbourne. There was a support with UMI and a Triple J live slot, neither of which set anything on fire, and I remember feeling frustrated about bringing more songs to the band than we could keep up with, as Matt and Mel had full-time day jobs and I was part-time, coming up with new demos to force into the set list at every rehearsal. Then in 2003, Matt moved to Sydney, and that was it. If my musical relationship with Matt could be described as a collaboration of chemistry and creative sympathy, which endured thanks to his ability to accept my all-guns-blazing approach, I was pushy and he wasn't, then my relationship with Tim was a volatile one because, like me, he took no half measures in how he expressed his views, but he also had objective, intuitive ideas about our potential which went beyond what we were writing in our bedrooms. Whatever the shimmering light in the distance represented for each of us, it was the fundamental ambiguity at the creative core of the American public which made it work. As Tim put it in a street press interview in 2001, I suppose we're trying very hard to say we're not about anything. I 